It's uh, five past 12. Welcome to our new webinar today. Um, I will give the floor directly to our director, Alexis Gustil. Thank you very much. Alexis, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. Um, can you hear me? Yes. So um, I'm very, very happy to, to, uh, to have to introduce this webinar because that's, that's a very important topic for us. Actually, uh, seven years ago, when I've been elected uh, to become the director of uh, the EMCDDA, part of my program was to propose not only to describe the past situation or to improve, to describe prison drug situation, but also, and especially today, in, in six months time, the EMCDDA regulation uh, will be 30 years old. So I found that uh, after 25 or 26 years of monitoring the drug situation in Europe, we should also develop a capacity to think about what could happen in the future and uh, what are the things that we may have to do to prevent or to cope with this. And, and I must say that uh, I am extremely happy and thankful because the, the EMCDDA staff that has been involved in that uh, uh, that project and that ID, which is uh, uh, Claudia Parkshak, Maria Moreira, but also Paul Griffith, uh, they have transformed what was a, an ID, an intention of mine, into something extremely great, extremely scientifically sound, and that uh, that has become now a toolkit that we are launching today and that uh, opens uh, new ways in which the EMCDDA in the future could make its work and the work of the Retox National Focal Point even more useful for decision makers at European or at national level. So first of all, once more, thank you very much because I think you did and you do a fantastic work in that area to the point that we, 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 we took some leadership and we have been inviting uh, other EU agencies that are members of the network of uh, uh, chief scientists of European agencies uh, to, to, to start and to continue uh, to develop a reflection on this. Uh, today, we have some, uh, some very, very close friends and good partners and colleagues. Um, the first who is going to, to speak, uh, I think, is Masej. And, uh, and uh, Masej is working in a place that I think... Oh, at the European or Brussels bubble, almost nobody knows. Even if it is a very important uh, institution, it's the Joint Research Center of the Com European Commission. And what people uh, know even less is that uh, in this Joint Research Center, there is a, a special service about foresight or future. Uh, there are, my sage among other things, is going to explain what is foresight, so I will not comment. Uh, but, but certainly, uh, I'm, I'm sure nobody imagine how strong we are in Europe in terms of uh, capacity, methodology, and, uh, and uh, Marseille certainly will, will give you some hints about uh, what the Commission and what all together we can do in that area. And it has been very supportive for EMCDDA and all agencies working in that area. Tim Rhodes, I think for those who follow uh, uh, drug policy and anything related to drugs. Uh, I think many people know Tim Rhodes for many, many years. I'm, I'm very happy to, to have him together with us uh, and, and, and for the presentation he's going to, to, to make and share with us today. Um, then we have uh, uh, three colleagues, three persons who have been extremely helpful, supportive, and actually that also uh, help the MCDDA team to discover and then to build strong competence in this area. It's uh, the, the first, of course, this uh, Cornelia Daheim from Future Impacts who has been working with us and is still working with us. And Cornelia, I think everybody in the center who was involved in that work is extremely thankful for that partnership and the things, the pleasure to work with you, but also what they've learned. And then we have uh, Brian Galvin, who's the head of the Irish Focal Point, who will, uh, who will uh, speak about uh, how this can be applied in the member state, in this case, Ireland. And uh, there is also a presentation from Lise Grémaud, who's the head of the Belgian Focal Point, 
on the project uh, that is uh, uh, grouping a, a few countries uh, and, and national focal points about uh, how this methodology could continue to be used also at national level. So I think you will get a, a perfect overview. And, and I think it comes this seminar and the toolkit that we are launching today, they come at a very, very important moment. Uh, as I said, uh, in the first years of the MCDDA, already a long time ago, uh, when there were criticisms, there were not so many, but some criticisms were saying, okay, you, you are quite good at describing the drug situation as it was four or five years ago, but okay, what about today? Today, especially thanks to complementary tools for data collection and for the robust European uh, drug information system, we have the long-term trends, the routine data collection. We have also complementary sources of information like wastewater, Euroden, uh, web surveys, uh, escape project with the residue analysis of the residues of syringes, plenty of other things. And this is actually helps us to understand much better what's happening now, almost in real time, when we speak about the early warning system. And, and uh, now, with this uh, new capacity that uh, we are still developing, acquiring, learning, and trying to ad adapt to our needs and further develop, uh, I think we, we really, really are at the moment where we can work, we have to work with the member states and provide them additional support to understand from these uh, recent trends in the European Union that we presented last week, which we can summarize with everywhere, drugs are everywhere, everything, everything can be used as a drugs. No more distinction between licit, illicit, vegetal origin, chemical origin, hard drugs, soft drugs, and everybody, everyone can be impacted by the huge availability and the changes on the drug market. So at this time, it makes it even more important to build, develop together a capacity, making use of data, because that's one of the key strengths of the MCDDA and Raytox network. But to make this, to put this at the service of uh, reflection scenarios, trying to understand what may come in the future. And if this was happening, can we prevent it or how could or should we react? And it's important because we celebrate almost 30 years of European drug policy. And, and we need to be now ready to learn, from, learn, learn the lessons from that experience to prepare and to prepare ourselves for the future challenges. And at the same time, we have uh, increasingly a wide number, a wide range of experts who have been influencing or at the origin of uh, very important changes in national or European drug policies over the last 30 years. Some of them already went on retirement, some others will follow, and we definitely need to prepare the next generation to be ready for the next challenge and learning also not only from some of the key achievements, but from some of the mistakes. And therefore, this foresight, this future exercise is uh, even more important than we imagine uh, seven or eight years ago when we started trying to understand what does it mean exactly. So thank you very much. And I really look forward uh, to listen to all the speakers uh, in this webinar. Thank you. Thank you to you, Alexis. The chairpersons for this uh, webinar today will be Claudia Palchak and Maria Moreira. I switch off my camera. I just recommend the participants to write their questions on the questions and answer functionality, the number of participants is going up. Uh, so thank you very much, Claudia, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Marika, I wanted to say good morning, but I see people from all over the world. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Again, my name is Claudia Palchak, and together with my colleague, Maria Moreira, we both work in the Scientific Coordination Unit of the EMCDD, we will be co-chairing this webinar. The objectives of the webinar are threefold. First of all, as mentioned by Alexis, we are launching today the EMCD Foresight Toolkit for the Drugs Area. But also with this webinar, we want to promote a foresight approach and we want to increase your knowledge and understanding of what foresight is. And finally, we want to take a stock of foresight activities within the drugs field and reflect on some possible ways forward. Mm -hmm. The agenda of today is really busy and exciting. We have a lot of distinguished panelists, so I don't want to take too much time uh, in the introduction. 
I would move directly to our first speaker, Maciej Krzysztofowicz, policy analyst in the Competence Center on Foresight, which is hosted by the European Commission Joint Research Center that Alex has mentioned about. Probably we are increasing their, uh, the knowledge of this institution as well today. Uh, Maciej works with horizon scanning, mega trends and foresight studies, and he will give you, I would say, a crash course on what foresight is. So Maciej, the floor, and I would say a challenge is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Let me write the things on the, on the side a bit. Uh, I hope that doesn't cover the screen too much. Uh, okay. No, my, ah, uh, yes, that, that works now. Yeah, fine. Okay. So that's, that's, I'm afraid the best I can do because I have some screen problems, uh, but uh, thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to talk a bit about foresight and especially foresight in the European Union, in the Commission, to give it a slightly broader um, broader angle. So, so, so your activities are very interesting and important, especially that they fall within a kind of a wider community and a wider activity of, of, of issues, which is, uh, which, is very, which is very exciting. So as was already mentioned, um, I'm part of the Competence Center on Foresight uh, that is hosted within the Joint Research Center of the Commission. And basically our role is to support the European Commission, but European Union in general, and, and all the stakeholders in building anticipatory capacity through foresight methods. So it is to actually embed thinking, a structured thinking about the future uh, into into the working of, of the Commission, into the policies, into the thinking about what you uh, could be. So <laughs> there is an increasing interest in, uh, in, 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 from the policy area in, uh, in foresight. And uh, especially now in the Commission with the specific role of the Commissioner Seftovic Sef on, um, on foresight, uh, there's also a kind of uh, reorganization, more and more people want to deal with foresight, want to work with foresight. Uh, I regularly get a question or a, a comment of people saying, uh, well, uh, I'm starting to work on foresight, maybe I should get a crystal ball. And I tell them immediately, you should not get one crystal ball, you should actually get five to 10 crystal balls, because you don't want to be limited to one future, you want to see at least 10, at least 15 alternative uh, futures. But um, to be more specific, so uh, foresight, um, we want to actually have a structured approach or looking into a medium and long-term future. And you could say, and people do say, well, we've always been doing that. So what the approach, the foresight approach actually gives you, first of all, it gives you more structure in this kind of thinking. It gives you the tools that let you think about it more um, uh, more, more in, in a more organized way, uh, it lets you, it gives you tools to actually make it more inclusive, to think about it not individually, not with only with a small group, but in a wider setting with more stakeholders, just bringing that kind of collective intelligence uh, into work. And finally, uh, what it does is actually, you know, with the more structured process and the more inclusive process, it actually gives you more diverse understanding of the future. And if we imagine that, uh, as we've seen with the recent examples, uh, the Ukraine war of, uh, of COVID, uh, even the wildest or less expected futures could become easily our reality, our understanding and our actually capacity to imagine more is crucial in thinking about uh, the future of uh, policies. So going back to the policy aspect of it. So people often assume uh, in the policy cycle, it falls under assessing impacts of policy, what impacts it will have in the future. But uh, this clearly is the kind of intuitive approach, but we think at all stages of the EU policy cycle, or, or generally policy cycle, or the policy cycle and how we understand it in the European Commission also, foresight could be useful. Uh, especially at an early stage when we uh, anticipate and develop strategies when, when, uh, when we are framing the issues that we want to deal with, framing them in a forward-looking way rather than as uh, problems from the past actually lets us imagine them better and work 
better with uh, those issues. On the other hand, negotiating uh, sort of interinstitutionally, negotiating inter internationally also works differently if you have actually a broader way of looking at things. If you have uh, already uh, been developing foresight, which was inclusive, where you have worked through assumptions, you have worked with different scenarios with people, the common basis and common understanding of different issues is different if you are just limited to conflicting uh, final uh, options. So, so we're trying to encourage foresight at all these dimensions of the uh, of the policy cycle but what do we then do in practice so just to get you very quickly up to speed to a very schematic way of, of working with uh, foresight uh, we start with horizon scanning or looking at the emerging and new signals of change which is complemented by megatrend analysis so looking at those uh, large-scale developments that are more persistent over time that we know will be happening over the next, say, 10, 20 years to actually formulate a story of the future. Uh, but this story of the future is, is, is pretty linear and it, it is more of an extrapolation of the current, current uh, situation. But we also start thinking, well, where are the uncertainties? What could actually change and go in different directions? And from that, we derive scenarios. So we actually think, well, this could be going this way or that way, and this could be going this and that way. And well, actually we have two or four or five or 15 plausible futures that we actually want to, want to imagine. But imagining a future is not the same as actually imagining yourself in the future. So then we work with visioning exercises to actually position yourself in that future. And it doesn't have to be in a particular scenario scenarios just set the landscape, but actually thinking what are the elements, what are the processes, but what are, what are the characteristics of, of your organization or a particular issue uh, in the future. And with backcasting, you can actually uh, come back and guide the direction. So we have already started with the present and the looking around, and we have gone to the future with scenarios and visioning. And, but the equally important part of foresight that we work on is actually coming back to reality now and acting on this additional knowledge, this, uh, these additional insights. And so working with other people who have not been also a part of process through policy gaming, again, creating, you know, creating serious games for interactions in these future situations, or maybe through speculative design, actually create future products or future possibilities and discuss it with people already. So all these elements for us are part, uh, are part of, the, uh, of the foresight. So uh, of course the toolkit uh, deals with that first element and it's a, it's, it's a necessary starting step to think about the future and to start from today. In the commission, uh, to, we have worked with different stakeholders and in different ways on, uh, on emerging issues and the horizon scanning uh, here is a is a graphic example from from the exercise we are doing for emerging environmental issues, where you take this funnel approach and start looking very broadly to then see which are the most interesting elements that are emerging, that are new, that could actually become uh, quite important. And the other dimension of that, looking at the trend analysis, are the mega trends. So we have developed. Uh, in the competence center, a set of 14 megatrends, which we uh, use and we help uh, policymakers use to actually uh, test and reframe their policy issues, how they could be look, how, how they could look like when they are, uh, when, when they will be confronted by or shaped by those megatrends in the next 10, 15 or, or, or 20 years. So that's the uh, situation of looking around and extrapolating. And of course, uh, the scenarios is, is what comes next. And they combine both uh, the elements uh, that change, but also what stays the same in all, all the, in all the different pictures. So that you can actually imagine a landscape of potential futures, of potential developments. Not only the four, the four actually give you the breadth of the futures. And uh, what we also very often people comment is that, well, I have my preferred scenario. And then we say, well, you know, would you really like this particular scenario or the elements from different scenarios which you like or don't like? And that's maybe 
often for us a, a better approach to see across the scenarios rather than focus on one or the other. And of course, once you look across the scenarios, you start to formulate a vision where in across those futures, where would I want to be or my organization, where does it want to be or my issue, where it could be. And, and that brings us to a kind of more developed uh, views of not only how the future could unfold, but also how, where we want to be in, uh, in the future. And the last element, Again, in uh, our processes, uh, I've mentioned uh, maybe the easiest and the most easy way to, to actually get people uh, back to thinking uh, sort of in actionable terms from all these imaginations of the future is through backcasting. So looking back what steps need to be taken and what different uh, events have to or may happen to actually arrive at the point that, that we want to be. Uh, in the in the vision, but we also engage people and and many stakeholders in exercises through serious games. So we have the scenario exploration system, which you see on the bottom left here, which is a serious game, which uh, with with about seven or eight stakeholders who actually um, role play uh, a particular scenario and imagine what would it mean for them, for their competitors. For, uh, for other stakeholders and work together to their goals in, in, the, in, the, in the longer term uh, future. But we also work with uh, speculative design. So examples of products of the future to get people imagine what is the environment in which these products find themselves? What is that future that, that this particular artifact is part of? We also work with future personas so we can imagine the people and their lives uh, in the future and with all the different methods that actually help us uh, help us go back from the future to thinking about well what does it what does it mean uh, for me so broadly uh, broadly this is a, a general description of the issues and the toolbox and i'm sure this will be mentioned more often is the first stepping stone into many of these other elements and and it's a good one and it already mentioned al uh, also mm -hmm. mentions the fact that you can actually from uh, from looking at the current situation looking at the trends both emerging and more established trends you can start imagining the different futures and the scenarios and go further with this which i would also uh, encourage you but if you don't have that first Good step. Uh, then, then the rest is much more, much more uh, difficult. So, finally, just to mention, uh, I've already said that there is a, a a process, a movement set in the Commission of of building strategic foresight and building anticipatory capacity, and all the activities that we are discussing fall into 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 that exercise uh, as well, because the purpose of of, of this is to First of all, bring the foresight community in the European Union together to actually get people benefit from, uh, make them benefit from, from the variety of methods and understand the variety of methods and approaches uh, there are, very much like the uh, process that is uh, led, uh, led by the AMC DBA on the, uh, on, on the, on, with the agencies. Uh, but also to actually, uh, you know, think together uh, about the future. So contribute to common thinking about the future, because in a way, the future of, of, of drug use or the future of drugs is not only the future of specific technologies, but you have to imagine the whole uh, lifestyles and lifestyles are, bro are also linked to the future of mobility, the future of education, the future of all these other aspects. So actually every exercise we're doing uh, at, at, at some granular level uh, actually builds up our broader, broader understanding of the changes that we could be seeing uh, in Europe and the potentials for, for the different futures uh, in Europe. And the part of the strategic foresight is actually to bring all that future knowledge together and, and actually open, open up this understanding and this imagination a bit further. And finally, so the exercise is to build anticipatory uh, capacity uh, in the institutions, but also with member states, with other institutions, and especially with stakeholders, so uh, so that we can actually 
uh, get a lot of a lot of new insights because because the diversity of views and the and the broad um, and the, the differences in, in both in understanding and in, in, in thinking about the future actually make us much richer in imagining richer, uh, richer futures. Uh, so uh, with that, I think uh, I would uh, want to finish. If you want to have more information, there, there are links here to some of the documents that the commission has uh, prepared on foresight. And uh, I think, I think that could be uh, a broad introduction into sort of a wider thinking of the trend analysis in a more sort of thinking about the diverse futures. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Maciej, very much. I'm sure there are already questions, but I want to say as well that we will probably take all the presentation first and we'll keep questions and answers sessions at the end of the, uh, of the meeting. So thank you so much. Uh, we will share the slides as well so everyone can explore more uh, the tools and methods that are developed by by your institution. So now let me move to our second speaker, uh, Tim Rose, who is a professor of sociology of public health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. His background is in qualitative research methods in the, in the field of drugs, health and epidemics, and he's currently doing work on the use of mathematic modeling as an evidence in policy. So in his presentation, he will be talking about the importance of future-oriented approaches, and he will be elaborating on some of the major drivers of change impacting the drugs area. So Tim, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, can somebody nod just to make sure I can be heard? It works. Fantastic. Um, so I think my role here uh, in, in a few minutes is to move us from the general as we've heard about foresight and its role in the commission more generally, uh, to move us a little bit closer to the drugs and the drugs policy field. Um, and then we're gonna obviously uh, move um, onwards to the toolkit specifically. Um, so, I, so I'm gonna be yeah, reiterating in some of the ways, you know, the, the importance of thinking ahead. Um, as Claudia says, I've done some work with the MCDDA to help map some of this thinking and some of the mega trends we might be thinking of in relation to signals uh, in terms of what might become in terms of drugs and drugs policy. The point we've just heard is about thinking ahead is about an anticipatory capacity, uh, which helps us respond better, arguably, and be more prepared. I think if I'm going to make one point um, in the presentation, it's that this, this work um, alters the present, it impacts in the now. So thinking about anticipating what might become alters the present and how we act in the now. So I, so I see this kind of form of ant anticipatory governance in a way as an intervention in itself, kind of in the now. So foresight is an intervention in and of itself, I, I think. Um, so, Oh, I can't move my slides. There we go. So this is what I want to cover. I want to kind of reiterate some of the points about um, we need to think beyond the now and the near present, as well as beyond the local and the proximal, to further away. Um, and part of the role in doing that is, is a shift in, um, in thinking, actually, to becoming more speculative. Um, at the same time, uh, our move from the local uh, to the bigger picture, I think, helps us become more ecological. It helps us situate the local and the proximal in the bigger picture. Uh, and this is why megatrends uh, are important. So obviously, it's a, it's, a, it's a complex challenge responding to a fast changing and agile world in relation to drugs and drug markets and so on. But part of that challenge and part of that complexity is because these things, drugs and drugs policy and drugs intervention, entangle with all sorts of other things, social, technological, environmental, political, and so on. So this is why thinking speculatively and further forwards is also about thinking ecologically. Two ways to do that, um, uh, devices, if you like, or ways to think with uh, in terms of doing speculative and foresight thinking are to think about big events, things which are beyond the local, but nonetheless affect the local, and megatrends, uh, which we've heard about and we'll hear more about um, in the next few minutes. 
So the current focus um, of much drugs monitoring and drugs policy work, in fact, as we heard at the very outset, tends to be quite near um, and local. Um, even epidemiology, which talks about risk factors as a means of thinking forwards, tends to do that on knowledge, which is observable kind of in the present, if you like, or at least in the recent present. So risk factors might help predict, they might help give us a sense of the likelihood of things or how probable things might be, but they do that on the basis of a fairly localized knowledge and a fairly proximal knowledge, which is close to the now. So what I think we're having to do today is move from that more proximal thinking, which tends to have a predictive flavor to it, more about probabilities, what we think might happen, to jumping further forwards, um, further into the future, further away from the now, to think more speculatively. So this is a question which is less about what is probable, what we think may happen. It's more of a question about what could happen, what is possible. So we're moving from probabilities to possibilities, what might happen, to what could happen, what the likely future is, to also what kind of possible alternative futures do we want to make? And from the local, as I said, to the bigger, more ecological picture. So that's our challenge. And it's been said, and by others in the drugs field, and here is a small quotation, for instance, from a drug policy researcher called John Hawkins, that we've had, relatively speaking, and inattention to the future. We've become much better at monitoring in the now. Uh, as we've heard, we have wastewater analysis. We have wonderful kind of technologies for doing better detection to help us do earlier warning. But now we're talking not just about detection, we're moving towards projection. And these are kind of different ways of thinking and doing our research. So John Corkin says that researchers tend to write only about what they can be sure of. And this is why they lean towards the now, what is observable, what they can see before them or, or recently. And consequently, they say little about the future, which is obviously much more uncertain and much more unknown. So foresight is also different, methodologically speaking, in terms of how we're used to working, I think. It takes us into the realm of engaging with uncertainty, with engaging with things which are less known. Uh, it's a different kind of evidencing. Now, foresight is one way, um, and uh, I'm very new to foresight, uh, like many of you might here also be new to foresight, um, but I, I've done some work around futuring uh, and in relation to modeling and simulation and other things. So some of my language in this presentation might be slightly different to that of foresight, but I think it nonetheless uh, it integrates. Now, foresight for me, and I think this was clear just a minute ago, um, it's not simply about prediction, it does necessarily involve the speculation and the kind of horizon scanning and the mapping of signals and weak signals and trends as to what might be going on out there is about the production of alternative futures for us to think with in terms of how to respond well. That is not prediction, that is not knowing or thinking that we know what might happen. This is putting alternatives before us and this is why I think foresight um, is an intervention in the now, because by deliberating on alternatives, the process of thinking through, discussing, talking through what we think could happen and what might be possible, is also a question of what we want to happen and what kind of futures we want to shape. So foresight is an intervention in the now. The process of doing this is a deliberative exercise. And I think that's why it's quite powerful for me. It's not merely about imagination. It's not merely about guessing. Um, uh, it, it, it's actually acting and thinking in the now and therefore not only being better prepared, but just thinking through how best we might respond. So this is why I think the whole theme of speculation is quite important for us. And to think about um, how speculative we might want to be when doing drugs policy and deliberating on what the alternative drug policy futures are that we might want to consider or, or even shape 
or make if we had the power um, to do so. And I would argue, and I put this before us, that maybe some foresight work is still quite proximal. It wants to be actionable, obviously, in policy. And it does still maybe tend to lean to some of the stuff which is more measurable. And maybe it could be even more speculative than perhaps it often is. So I put that before us uh, as we consider foresight and how we might want to use it in drug policy is how speculative do we want to be? How much do we want to use this as a way of intervening in changing the possible futures that we might be moving towards rather than just guessing what they might or could be? One example, it's a rather obvious one. Uh, I'm also leaning again on John Corkins and his work um, is some uh, simulation and scenario based work he did around uh, uh, drug policy change in relation, to, for instance, decriminalization or legalization. Um, where, um, and he describes this kind of as a game um, with players. So that it leans very much towards kind of speculation and uh, not prediction. And this kind of simulation on scenario kind of game playing, um, uh, as Corkin says himself, he says, I would be shocked if looking back after 20 years after having done this, if all, or if even if the majority of these speculations discussed proved true, that's not the point. His goal was to raise questions and provoke discussion, not to provide definitive or certain answers. So this is the flavor, I think, the ethos of speculative work is to deliberate and to work through options. And that's why it intervenes. So I've no idea how much time I've got left, Claudia. Um, but let's talk uh, about two ways to think about doing this, big events and mega trends. I want to mention big events as well as mega trends, because uh, we are living in many big events. Um, Ukraine is one such example. The COVID-19 pandemic is another. And I think they illustrate very well how we can't separate out or isolate drugs from anything else. You know, that our social and material, our economic and policy and political lives are very much an entanglement. Uh, they, they entangle locally, but they also relate to the global. So a big event is something which as can be described and sociologists like to make up new words as global. It's felt both globally and locally and there's interactions going on all the time and you can't separate them out. So our job, I think, is to try and speculate what those entanglements might be. How might a war in Ukraine or a pandemic which uh, 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 relating to a viral kind of infection have on, you know, bring with it a whole bunch of sometimes unexpected, as well as other kind of uh, events and effects, which might in turn and indirectly shape drugs and drug markets um, locally. So big events are usually considered to be unexpected shocks to the ecology um, of a system, I think. I won't say more about them, because I think the COVID-19 pandemic in Ukraine offer excellent examples in and of themselves. So let's speculate for a moment about mega trends. Now there's different ways of describing these and the, the list I have here is a little bit different to that in the toolkit. And this is step one perhaps of the horizon scanning which we might be doing when thinking and speculating on drug futures. But the list here does overlap um, very much with that in the toolkit. And I just want to kind of illustrate these um, before I end this presentation, as we move more towards drugs and drugs policy. So, for instance, we could take any of these and talk about them in more, more, more detail, and we'll hear more about these in a minute. But climate, for instance. Uh, I mean, climate models uh, predict more rain in high latitudes, which can lead to flooding, for instance, more forceful tropical cyclones, greater wind speed, and so on, and these potentiate alterations in the farming and cultivations of crops. And that includes poppy, it includes cannabis, it includes coca. So you can imagine how these kind of mega trends in terms of climate change alter drug productions. Uh, you might foresee, for instance, greater shifts towards coca because it's more resilient in some of these conditions ecologically. Or you might imagine uh, shifts towards more laboratory-based um, illicit drug productions. 
But a point I want to make is any one of these mega trends, which we could speculate around, interact and entangle with others. So we can think about the environment in other ways, for instance. We can think about how illicit drug productions in and of themselves might alter the ecology. So, you know, through, through toxic waste, through greenhouse gas emissions, through deforestation, for instance, through unsustainable water. We can think how drug eradication efforts, which attempt to disrupt those illicit drug productions themselves, impact ecologically through deforestation, the displacement of populations and their illicit trades, and so on. So these things all interact. Um, it's important to, to see ecological shifts as not as separate, but as deeply connected. I could have other examples, but we don't have time. Uh, let's say a word about population. This is maybe getting us closer to the world of drugs and drugs policy, perhaps. Um, we have a growing global population, particularly in lower income countries, an aging one, particularly in Europe. We have increased urbanization, which of course overlaps with drugs in quite direct ways. We have massive migration flows, which again create or exacerbate precarities, which indirectly affect drugs, uh, be that as a coping mechanism or as a source of kind of livelihood and so on. I mean, at the population level, have growing problems of mental health, um, which again link to drugs um, in, in different ways. So you can see how these population shifts, which are occurring out there at distance, are nonetheless having potentially local effects on your drug markets and patterns of drug use. Um, there's many others I could talk about, uh, and many of these we're going to be familiar with, and they're all in the toolkit. Um, so I don't think I need to mention too many more, but digitalization and, and major shifts in communication um, are an obvious one, both in terms of drug markets, the ability to do surveillance around them, as well as paradigm shifts in research and how we pull together knowledge, uh, as well as you know, the role of artificial intelligence and technological digitalized intervention um, in, in the drugs field. Drug treatments too, um, the future is often said to be very biotechnology, biotechnological. Um, there's many, many kind of innovations um, happening as we speak with very unforeseen or unpredictable social consequences. We could talk about them. We could talk about policy itself and discursive shifts um, and mega trends and emerging trends which signal different kinds of ways of doing policy globally. Uh, I would argue, for instance, you could see signals that there's a general tendency over the last 20 years, uh, which move us towards more risk and rights orientated approaches to drug policy, slightly away from criminalization and simple models of supply and demand. We might speculate that we are moving into a post drug war era, who knows? But these are the kind of discursive shifts we might be able to identify in policy. I'm gonna stop because of time and we need to move more towards the kind of nuts and bolts of the toolkit in terms of how we do foresight work in the drugs and drugs policy field. So I'm just gonna conclude with a few points. The first is this is not just about time for me and thinking beyond the present, it's about how we think beyond the local and more ecologically. Uh, and I think that's really, really important. It situates our work in the social and in the economic and in the global space. Um, and not just in, in the local one. Secondly, for me, um, I think specula speculation and moving beyond prediction, if you like, and beyond probability into the realm of possibility, it, it, it provokes, it creates deliberation, it, it creates debate on what the alternative futures might or could be. And I think that's really where foresight work is at its richest and where it is really basically doing intervention through the process of uh, deliberation. So I'm going to end there. And uh, thank you very much for uh, being part of this webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim, for this uh, really insightful presentation. I think it already brings us much, much closer 
to um, you know real challenges and issues in the drugs field and uh, it's the perfect follow-up for the more general presentation that Maciej started with I think we're on a, a journey and um, and getting more and more concrete about topics that are obviously interesting for 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 all the participants who are with us today um, I, I would like to, to ask the participants to feel free to drop their questions using the Q&A uh, function or on the chat box uh, so that we can uh, really start uh, organizing them and hopefully addressing them at, at the end of, this, um, of, of the presentations. But for now, I, I would really like, uh, and I'm very happy to um, introduce um, my colleagues, Paul and, and Claudia, who will uh, talk a little bit more about the MCDDA uh, Foresight Toolkit, which we are launching today. So I, I'll start by giving the floor to uh, Paul, Paul Griffiths, who is the Scientific Director of the MCDDA and also the, the Head of the Scientific Coordination Unit where the MCDDA Futures Project is hosted. Paul, the floor is yours. Um, we can see the, yes, that's perfect, perfect. Okay, can you hear me, Maria? Yes, yes. Um, and thanks, Tim. That's a great uh, overview of bringing us towards the drugs area. I'm going to frame a little bit the toolkit. Um, and I really like this idea as Forsyth's, Forsyth's as an intervention. And one of the things we don't talk about a lot, but where it's been used very successfully, is as a tool in conflict resolution. And, and, it, and again, it's getting different people with very different perspectives together and trying to get them to imagine a desired common future. So I think it's a really important to understand that what we're doing is actually intervening in the present by looking to the future. So just quickly, we've said already the foresight exercises, exercises including part of our strategy, we didn't really know for us, it was a very much a learning exercise. And it was really prompted by the reflection and the recognition that the world is changing ways that had important implications for drug monitoring, our work, our core business, but weren't in the necessarily being driven by things internal to our world. So it's, it was external to our world, but changing our world in important ways. And we needed a way to start thinking about that better and understanding that a little bit. And so what I'm going to do here is say a bit about the main findings from the foresight exercise. It was a modest, it was us putting our toes in this water. Um, and a little bit how it's affected us as an organization in terms of our systems level thinking. And that's been, I think, one of the key things we've got out of it. And also as a wash on from that, the need for a toolkit, which we're going to present today and we're very pleased with. I think, and again, it comes back to some of the stuff we've heard already. It's, an, this is not some, it's, it's a journey, not a destination. This is an ongoing task. We're about, if we think, if we were doing this exercise before COVID, before Ukraine, it would be very different than it is after. It's an ongoing accomplishment. It's to inform our current exercises, and that, and as this means, that this is it's constantly evolving task. So I think this is something we've learned at the organisation. It isn't something you do once, tick it off. It's something you try and build into your thinking and your systems. So just to give you a little bit, it was a modest exercise, but it's still I think we did quite an impressive amount of work um, over this, and we had a number of events from a. a, a a major theme at Lisbon Dictions in 2019. So we've got lots of different speakers there on the foresights and futures perspective. And then we had lots of different uh, workshops, both with, an, and with the staff here, with uh, focal points, with a policy group. And what we found from that was almost like an infection because it went on and we saw other uh, different stakeholders wanting to do their own workshops, getting interested and in moving on. And I think that was one of the most exciting things for us, not only did I think it prove value to our stakeholders? It was also a really good way of engaging with our stakeholders and working together, co-production being a very core part of uh, this approach. Um, and just in terms of some, well, they were very different groups. There was a little bit of group think. We were coming from, you know, struggled sometimes to get outside our own uh, different perspectives. But what was also lots of commonalities and lots of um, consensus emerging from groups. And certainly in terms of the mega trends, the way we looked at for, for the workshop process, you had these five mega trends, which most of the groups identified as being particularly salient to the drugs area. And they were accelerating technology change and hyper -con connectivity. We worked with the JRC's mega trends toolkit um, and then looked at those collectively. And these are the ones that people, uh, the, most of the groups 
coalesced on, diversifying inequalities, shifting health challenges, uh, increasing demographic, demographic imbalances, and climate change and environmental degradation. And Tim said a few words about these, but what I think is interesting that these came from all the groups. These are not things we normally think about. These are often things that are outside our immediate day-to-day -day, um, concerns and discourse. And yet, when we got together, we talked about them. These are the things that we agreed were profoundly shaping the drugs world. So again, just a, a very simple example, I think, why these approaches are beneficial. And then the second level of that was looking at emerging trends and weak signals coming from the drugs area. And again, there was, I think, from the groups, we had a lot of diversity, a lot of different directions. But a number of things emerged from that commonalities, and there was a lot of focus and shifting in terms of drug policies, and drug laws. So are we moving to more, more harm rather than criminalization policies? Uh, how, look, uh, how are cannabis policies changing, alternatives to imprisonment? So a whole range about the shift in the policy discourse, but also a shift beyond that in uh, concepts of addiction, whether it's in terms of normalization, but also extending it to behavioral addictions, um, uh, and that also the overlap between some of the uh, how we think about addiction and the use of substances and some of the beneficial things we might see in terms of new therapies. There was a big and a lot of focus and I think possibly thing in shifting drug markets, looking at how these were becoming more globalized and digitally enabled, so more globally connected, rising the importance of synthetic drugs, production closer to consumers, increasing diversity, things like medicine, the a blurring of distinction between medicines, MPS, and the controlled and non-controlled substances. And also how this was also washing through, and again, this globalizing digital approach into how we respond. So looking at how services were adapting, M&E health initiatives, but also new pharma therapies that are becoming uh, online, and also the locating of the work we do, the therapeutic work we do in a much broader context of health and wellness and generic services. And just to show you a little bit about how that all maps out um, uh, when you put it all together, we've got the sort of text of the day and we're looking at these emerging trends in the drugs field and then we're reflecting that in a broader horizon of how uh, wider changes in the ecology, as Tim called it, uh, are impacting. And again, I think this, some of these, the graphical representations that you develop for this work are really helpful because they, they help you uh, conceive the world in different ways than we're nor than normally the, the way we look at things, which is very linear in our thinking. And how, and I think this is for me, one of the kind of obvious, but good things are often obvious once you realize them, ways it affected our systems thinking. And as an organization, as a monitoring agency tasked with doing the work we do, really we need to think systemically and really we have our routine monitoring and that's based in the past, it's robust, it's reliable, we can quantify uncertainty often, uh, often um, but it's not reactive. And then we've got the things, uh, Tim, we're talking about the more early warning, threat assessment, it's more proactive, these are emerging signals, it's things we're following up with, we need to investigate a little bit. There's far greater uncertainty there. And then we move on, there's foresight, and so this is where we get much more speculative, but very active, because there's also this idea of anticipating and maybe creating and anticipating and avoiding negative futures and um, identifying and working towards more positive futures. And I think as in terms of the way we think systematically about how we use information, we really want to, within our systems, do all these things, recognizing that all of them are necessary, all of them have strengths, all of them have uh, weakness or differences in terms of both uh, certainty and use we put to them but at a systems level we want to incorporate all these things into our thinking and i think as an agency that's been a very important outcome for us in terms of looking at this work so just finding terms of the outcomes from our initial and i must say modest um uh delve into this area um i think we have much better now understanding the role and the value of futures and foresight's work in in our day-to-day -day work and how we need to continue that and build that into our process and our, work, our, our working practice. Um, and I think in doing that, we recognize that that it has advantages for today. It is an intervention. It can help us become a more agile, forward-looking agency and make our staff more sensitive how, about how some of these things are impacting on today's work and how they need to think about that for the things they're developing, um, even in the short term. 
Um, we set up a repository tools and methods. This is an area where uh, understanding and um, uh, information sources are growing very really quickly. So just having these in one place has been really useful. And it's made us aware of, um, of how much activity is ha uh, happening at the EU level in terms of the EU infrastructure and the value of actually networking and reaching out and the JRC have been particularly helpful in this respect. Um, it's given us, certainly given us analytical insights into future information needs and areas that are actually very important. So it's informed our thinking today about what we might do in the future. And it's been, again, I didn't really expect this. It's been a really useful catalyst and tool for activities with stakeholders. And in that, this co-production thing, actually working with stakeholders has changed our thinking, but also been valuable to them. So it's been a really important and useful communication tool. And from that, the idea of the toolkit came out because we saw a lot of interest amongst the stakeholders groups. And that's very much what the thinking about why we've, we've crystallized this into um, a set of tools that we will use ourselves in house, but we also making available for various stakeholders who want to embark on their own uh, foresights or futures journey. And that's all I want to say, except just to leave on this quote the, from Will, William Gibson, the futures here is just not um, evenly distributed yet. Many of the things that we look at and think about in the drugs field that we think of future developments, whether they're drug delivery by uh, drones, it's psychoactive medicines being supplied in the post, or it's uh, beer that can turn, uh, contains THC. These are actually happening in parts of the world now. So a lot of some of these future things are actually already happening, but often outside our vision. Thank you. And that's my introduction to Claudia and the toolkit. Thank you very much, Paul. That was a great overview on the journey we're going through. And uh, also, thank you for the excellent timekeeping. Um, I, I now give the floor to um, to Claudia, who is the uh, project lead for the, the Futures Project at the MCDDA. Claudia is also the principal scientific manager who is working with Paul and I at the Scientific Coordination Unit. And she will now um, present to you the, the, the toolkit that we're launching today. Claudia, the floor thank is you. yours. Thank you, Maria. Um, can you hear me? Can you see the slides? Yes, yeah? perfect. Absolutely. All great. So I'm, 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 I'm really excited to present you the EMCDD foresight toolkit for the drugs field, which is really a practical guide on how to prepare a run and run the trans workshop. So something a bit practical, growing from this theoretical uh, part, but uh, hopefully uh, useful. So I will elaborate a bit on why we've developed the toolkit, but Paul already mentioned several of the important elements for whom it was created and how we can apply it in practice. So basically, as mentioned by Paul, I think we are giving you results of our journey and our capacity building and liter uh, future literacy building within the EMCDA. We were looking at different methods that, and techniques that are applied in the futures uh, area, and also how different organizations and EU institutions are applying foresight in different policy fields, but also in different settings. We were also looking at different capacity building tools that they were developing, and this is how our thinking was steered. And as you've heard, we had this first exercise which looked into the future of the drug monitoring by 2030. So our horizon was 10 years. And we've selected one of the tools that Maciej mentioned, which is an environmental scanning, a holistic analysis, 300 degrees analysis of the external environment, analysis of trends, events that are impacting drugs area, but they are going much more beyond the drugs area and beyond Europe as well. So what you can see is basically the environmental scanning, as mentioned many times, was framed by the mega trends of Joint Research Center. And the weak signals or emerging trends in the drug situation were very much informed by the intelligence collected by the EMCDDA, some additional data collection analysis and information and also the work uh, prepared by team as well, informing our analysis of the drug situation. And the trends we were looking at were of societal, technological, economical, ecological, and political nature. And this is really, I think this is the key that we had a framework that made our analysis possible in a systematic way. And I think for science-based organization in general is a particularly important. But as Paul mentioned, what was important was this participatory and collective sense-making and vision sharing. So we've invited a lot of our stakeholders to the trends workshop, and that's particularly important for this toolkit because it explains you how to prepare these workshops. And we've invited um, our partners, we've invited researchers, analysts, uh, policymakers, but also communication experts 
to really brainstorm and also to bring their own ideas on what are the changes that are happening or will impact the drugs area and will have a direct impact into the work uh, of the EMCD and the drug monitoring system in the future in, the gen in general. So I would say it was intellectually intensive exercise, new, engaging, and again, I want to highlight what Paul was saying, as much as methods are important, we were really building our future mindset, future-oriented mindset. People were open, people started to be aware about the changes outside of the area of work. And as mentioned before, really everyone was asking how we can replicate this activity, how we can do that at our institutional level or even our at the national or ministry level. So basically the toolkit we are uh, publishing today is a response to our customers' needs and we, it aims to support the EMCDD stakeholders, actors, researchers in the drug field to implement their own foresight exercise in the form of, the, of an introductory trends-based workshop. Again, it builds on the toolkit developed by the uh, Joint Research Center, which we found very useful, but it also builds on our work at the EMCDDA, and you will find the trend card specific for the drugs area, which are actually outcomes of this joint deliberation and speculations with our, our community. We tried this, uh, we, I think we've created, and I think we try to believe that it's very practical, easy to use and simple. And it really describes how you go through the whole process step by step. Still, the guiding questions um, are really looking at 300 degrees of uh, analysis of your environment. So the key, key questions are what kind of changes you can observe already, why these changes are happening, at what speed, what does it mean for your organizations, for your actions, for your work, and which um, changes uh, should, should we be prepared for, which we would like to avoid or foster. And this is, again, this notion of taking future as something you can shape rather than something given, yeah? working with the futures for your uh, current actions. But in terms of the context, content of the toolkit, you will find an introduction to foresight and a bit of explanation of how the trends analysis should look like. You will find there are tools and templates for running the workshop and some references to additional information and sources if you want to go deeper into the foresight. So as I mentioned, you will go through the key phases of the process. So we are explaining how the trends workshop should be organized, how the agenda can be shaped, who should be invited to these meetings, how you should facilitate them, but also what should be the objective of your meeting. And I think this, we are putting emphasis on being realistic. Obviously in one hour and a half or three hours, four hours, you will not uh, manage to create a future-proof strategy for your organization, but you will definitely gain an insight into the changes impacting the drugs area and consequently your work. You can also, I would say that, that that's also important to, 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 to gain the curiosity within the organization and this willingness to, uh, to do this type of work. We are explaining typical steps of trends analysis and you will see how you start with identification and mapping of the trends, what to do not to miss or overlook critically potentially high impact developments, so the blind spots, how to identify them and what is the role of really broad and inclusive exercise as much as was mentioning. How you can prioritize the trends. So, you know, we cannot address all the changes we are thinking about or we are seeing, but how you build a consensus of what are the critical and most impactful trends for your area of work, and then what are the actions to be taken. And again, for each step of this analysis, we are providing templates, some with the examples of how we did it uh, within the ENCDDA, but also some empty templates you can use for your work. And um, also you will find online um, trends cards and uh, some of the conclusions of our work and also some um, recommendation on how to do the activity on site or online. We've started, as Paul mentioned, this whole exercise before COVID. So we've managed to have few trend workshops face-to-face -face organized, but then uh, with the pandemic, we had to switch to online um, mode and it works perfectly well. I think with today communication tools like we have now, but also online um, tool sharing uh, applications and text sharing applications, it's possible and it works. And we, we also um, encourage you to do that. And then some key issues for considerations because I'm mindful of the time. It's important to think then and to keep in mind that this toolkit presents only a fraction of activities and perspective utilized in fully fledged trend analysis. So ideally we would complement the trends workshop with additional research and analysis steps. 
But still, we believe that as a standalone work, it's a taster of the approach of working with trends, and it really covers the main steps that you would do while analyzing the trends. Also, as Paul mentioned, it's a living document. Also, this toolkit is a living document. So we are really curious to hear your experience in applying this uh, toolkit, what we could uh, improve on our website, but also what are the results of your work? What are the additional trends that you've identified? Because as mentioned before, we are moving over the time, new really disruptive uh, things are happening. So I'm sure they will also impact the, um, the analysis within your institution and organization. And again, I think we, we, we imagined uh, our focal points to use it, but also a group of researchers or policy or organization. But I think it's for anyone, any individual who wants to go through this analytical process. And finally, uh, we are planning uh, within the EMCDD some capacity uh, activities and trainings uh, for our stakeholders. But we are also really pleased to hear that there are already other initiatives happening within the drugs area which will be mentioned by our stakeholders later today, and, and we are really excited about that. So I would say, go to our website, go through the, um, the material that we've collected and published, and we are really um, grateful for any feedback or questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Claudia. Uh, I'm also mindful of the time. There would be a lot to say on this. Uh, and I've already copy pasted the link to the toolkit, which was launched and is already available publicly on our website. Um, the link is uh, in the chat box. Uh, but I would um, straight ahead go to Brian Galvin for uh, some uh, additional insights on uh, practical implementations aspect, aspects of, of working with foresight and having already the experience uh, of, 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 um, of implementing this, this approach. Brian is the head of the Irish uh, Raytox National Focal Point and a program manager for drug and alcohol research at the Health Research Board Evidence Center in Ireland. And you will also be covering for Lise, who unfortunately uh, last minute could not uh, could not join us. So Brian, thank you very much for joining us and the floor is yours. Okay, thanks very much, Maria. Um, I just want to give some uh, quick, ob quick um, observations uh, and thoughts on our experience. Um, uh, we held um, a Megatrends workshop as part of our, um, our National Drugs Forum uh, in Dublin. This is um, um, an annual event um, at the meeting of stakeholders. It's a very broad group, so it includes not just the um, the type of policymakers and research researchers that are comfortable with the the type of uh, speculation that 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 Tim mentioned um, uh, are global issues, but but the uh, but everybody working in the drugs area. I think it's important that we that we manage to include them because it, it's not. Just a democratic issue, but but it um, it allows us to have insights that we would normally have if, if, if we um, uh, confined it to, to, to more senior stakeholders. It's important to to introduce the concept to force it right through our drug a um, uh, 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 drug stakeholder. Community. So just a couple of takeaways. Uh, operation um, the interactive work of this type does. T t does uh, take a lot of planning. And the event that we held in, in 2021, uh, it was online, which uh, did present um, its own difficulties. I'd say the bulk of the discussion as we prepared the, the, the workshop was on how we'd manage the interactions um, in the various working groups, um, how discussions were to be led and uh, facilitated. Um, the recording, uh, and the role of the facilitators. So we didn't give huge attention to the uh, choosing the megatrends. Uh, it's in a way the actual topics were, um, I think, secondary. The, 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 the important thing was to get people into um, uh, a way of thinking about it. So that that took quite a lot of work before we even uh, uh, sat down. The next key uh, takeaway is. Uh, Facilitation. We recruited, I think, uh, 12 facilitators, uh, and these were people that I knew that would be capable um, and willing uh, to lead a discussion. I, I think it's essential. Um, I think local facilitators with knowledge of the issues and the personalities, uh, they're best place to adapt, to keep discussion on track, 
uh, and to deal with uh, potentially tricky uh, situations. Um, and, um, and Jessica led a, a, a training session with these facilitators that went on a lot longer, I think, than we had anticipated because people had a lot of questions, but they became engaged. So that's who who leads, who facilitates. Uh, these are the um, um, key things that you have to think about before you do any kind of workshop like this. I said that the megatrends themselves weren't the most important thing, but it's important to work with um, many megatrends um, at the same time. Uh, and I was clear from the group's the observations that were recorded, um, as a lot of megatrends, they overlapped and reinforced impact of the other. Like, things like climate change is, is very linked to migration, which is, of course, linked to to housing and the built environment and uh, uh, and place based issues in in drugs is um, um, has been a um, a real as um, was concern in Ireland. So these these things all um, uh, as wrap around each other. Things like the, the aging population uh, and the demands on health services is that going to harden attitudes to people who um, who use drugs but never even considered that. So that's these these are things that emerge from people with direct experience of working in the situation. So finally, we we, um, we ask people to do quite, quite easy exercises, and that's important. Uh, and Jessica was, was very good on that. Don't be too ambitious, stick to the, <laughs> stick to the plan. Uh, the responses were, they're imaginative and thoughtful. Um, and I think we did succeed in reducing the, the basic concept of foresight to people, but the impact of these 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 kind of one-off sessions is quite limited. I have to admit that it was enjoyable, it was fun. But if we're going to do further work in this area, I'd imagine we work with people um, who um, who are enthusiastic, who are naturally inclined to think in that way, and they could develop uh, a deeper understanding of ideas, um, and they could work within their own spheres um, and gradually introduce the concept to, to others. I'm thinking of a, a type of train the trainer approach, something similar that's used in the uh, uh, UBC, EUPC. So that's a very quick run through the Dublin uh, event. And I um, I got notes from Lise on uh, uh, drug prep. Uh, um, unfortunately, Lise had, was called away to another very important meeting <laughs> with her uh, her daughter, who I think is about four weeks old at the moment. So I'm um, um, the drug prep. The the application of the drug prep was prepared by Lise and uh, uh, and John Peter in um, in Trimbos. So they're they're the people who have the detailed knowledge of it. Just to let you know that. But drug prep is a, a DG Joss funded research project and his partners in uh, six European countries. And I, uh, I started by Trimbos in the Netherlands and Santano in Belgium. So the, the idea is to, uh, is to support policymakers uh, and researchers and, um, and civil society to become better prepared uh, for the Future and respond to threats. So the objectives, and these are these are across the the five working packages of the um, six working packages of the uh, of uh, the project. And we're beginning with to to identify and assess current needs and responses to emerging drug problems in European countries, and work on that um, has begun already. The next uh, objective is to. To identify future trends and developments, um, uh, and that's using the uh, uh, strategic foresight tools. So I'm sure the toolkit itself will be of um, some use in that. Uh, strengthening capacity building of national defense systems by um, sharing experience of preparedness and foresight, and finally uh, translate gain knowledge into into the national policy domain. Uh, I think that's the most challenging uh, part of this. As Lise pointed out in her note to me, a big, a big part of the, the impulse to do this work is to build on the, the knowledge translation work that, that all the focal points are interested in. It's, it's a continual um, challenge. How do we ensure that the, the uh, our data analysis is used in policy uh, decisions. So uh, at certain, and I, I think Lise, I hope I'm not um, 
paraphrasing her too much, there is a certain frustration there. And, and uh, even with all the various techniques and tools that we have of trying to get evidence in, um, um, into policy, it's, 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 it's still not as where we are. So we see this as an opportunity to uh, um, speak to policymakers in a, a language or a, a, a tone that, the, 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 um, that they will find. Um, we think um, extremely useful uh, as they anticipate future threats. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you for sharing the, the experience with us. I think this is really important for anyone who wants to take this up and, uh, you know, move towards the implementation level. And I think that also the, the journey is bringing us, it's very encouraging for us to see how member states are, um, are picking this up. And I think the, the, the journey brings us to this participatory approach and collective intelligence intelligence that Maciej was was mentioning at the very beginning. Um, I, I see we have very little time left, but I, I don't want to uh, to end this uh, before giving the floor to Cornelia Danheim, um, because Cornelia, who is the founder and director of Future Impacts, um, Future Impacts is a company that supports organization in and with foresight projects, and they have been our external contractors on this project, and Cornelia leads a team of uh, brilliant and wonderful people who have really been um, uh, amazing in terms of the support uh, that was given to the MCDDA. So, Cornelia, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Maria, and thank you, everyone. Um, glad to be here, and I'm a bit flustered by the kindness. I'm glad to hear that, and it's a pleasure to be a part of this process. And uh, yeah, being aware of the time also, I'll make it very short. Uh, there's lots to say, I think, um, but also maybe we still have a moment and uh, left to, to take a couple of questions. And let me just try not really to wrap up now, because I think we have a portfolio of pieces of information around foresight uh, in our hands now. But maybe just say a bit of things as a taster towards what's to come. Because um, while you have a toolkit now in your hands, everybody who's joining here, um, there's also, as we have said, uh, seen uh, in the presentations before, a lot of other questions uh, apart from looking at trends that you could cover in foresight. Um, and something around this is coming up. Um, you've seen that uh, the perspectives and tools are broad and wide. But on the other hand, you could also break it down very much when you try to build foresight capacity. And I think many of you are maybe here because they want to start that kind of practice. And while it's of course a simplification, you could say that most foresight exercises in a way take these two fundamental perspectives of on the one hand, horizon scanning, looking at the changes that are out there where now you have the starting point of the toolkit by EMCDDA to really put this into practice in a practicable way to take first steps, gain some experience, see how it can work in your organization and your context. But then the horizon scanning maybe probably cannot answer all questions. And scenarios are really a way to then go into a more, you could say, speculative space. Where in the horizon scanning, you start from a perspective of asking what changes can we already see? How can we make sense of the stuff where we have the evidence in our hands, where we can observe the past and today in a way? With the scenarios, you can go towards this more speculative arena of thinking about alternative futures, also a term I think you have heard quite a bit. And we've heard already about why that makes sense, but just to say there's two fallacies the scenarios can help with. One is that we tend to imagine the future is kind of a thing of the present. Uh, Henry Ford has said, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. So we tend to think something like today, but just a little bit better. Um, and that, well, hasn't worked so much. We've heard a couple of words already and people have spoken before about disruption. And we have all been in the midst of disruption in the last two years with the pandemic, now the Ukraine war, just to name the top ones. Um, and the upcoming climate crisis, um, the ongoing climate crisis is, is the next one to keep us busy. But just to have that said, we maybe don't want to acknowledge it, but disruption has been around for quite some time. September 11, Fukushima, financial crisis, that has all been there. 
And it's tough to make sense of it in organizational planning. But on the other hand, the signals have been there and scenarios can be a great tool um, to sort of make sense of how we could deal with disruption, which ones we have to prepare for maybe, um, and where it would help if we had a sort of backup plan in our, in our desks. So, and all these examples have been a part of foresight reports, but also Bill Gates do. Huh? So it is possible to scan a bit for disruption too, and scenarios are just simply a great tool to do so and, and think about these alternative pathways. And that's really what's upcoming and where we have the pleasure again to work with and for EMS CDDA to, to get that on the road. Um, so this is just a taster and a preview. We've just started working on this um, and scenarios will be developed. And it will use two principles um, that I think characterize very much the uh, force and capacity building work that EMC DDA is doing, uh, which is on the one hand to, to utilize existing resources which we have really in our hands in Europe uh, in, in many, many ways, as much as possible, and not reinvent the wheel where we don't have to maybe. Um, so we're starting from what's there already in the trends toolkit, in the EMC DDA foresight reports, all the trends that have been identified will sort of play a part in creating the backbone of the scenarios, which to become not too technical now are, are developed in a transparent key factor based kind of approach. There's various scenario methodologies, but this one lends itself to doing it this kind of way. And the second principle is again, a deep involvement of the stakeholders and the community, I would call it. So also you, I guess, and hope. Uh, and just to flag that and to end on that note, there will be a workshop hopefully uh, also focusing on this um, at the Lisbon Addictions Conference, where also all these perspectives from the different stakeholders can again be integrated into that process. And I'll not try more of a wrap up, Maria, if that's okay. Um, I'll just leave it here and maybe we have a bit of time so for questions or whatever you have in mind, okay? Thank you, Cornelia. Thank you for being really uh, brief. And um, I'm thinking because we are starting questions and answer sessions and we don't have much time left. So maybe I will start with the first question and you may try to answer to it, but I, it's open to other panelists. So if anyone wants to, to elaborate on that, we have a question about participation, inclusiveness and how different groups could be invited to this exercise. So it's more about what do we have to think about when we are thinking of, of our participants of the workshops? How broad the group should be? You know, how to avoid this uh, group thinking that everyone is so afraid of? If you could elaborate on that a bit. Yeah, again, I'll try briefly, though I could go on now for three hours, but I'll try not to. Um, as diverse as you can, without going overboard would be a sort of blueprint, I think, when you get started. So um, not to get only the same people who always discuss matters into the same room, but maybe more of a mix. But at the same time, I would also recommend, which I think is a learning for most organizations who go on that journey of building force and capacity, uh, to maybe not start with too big a group because you are still probably figuring out how you can implement this well. Mm? So maybe start with a workshop where you have a smaller group, um, unless you have a lot of experience in, in how to do that already, um, and then build from there. Mm? So take it a step-by-step -step approach, but diversity is a key criterion in, in most uh, foresight uh, processes. Um, going up to a board facilitation of, you could say, citizens, the population, maybe in this case, um, also clients or drug users or social policy uh, on the ground, um, which has also uh, happened and been done before. Mm? But still, I'd say as much as diversity as you can, but building it step by step mm, to gain some experience of how it can be done well in your context and be usable in the end. Thank you. Thank you, Cornelia, a lot for the presentation and answering. And um, maybe the second question, because I think it was brought by Brian as well, is how we make sure that the findings of the fourth side are really taken up by the organization. So how we make sure that uh, within the organizational context, the, the findings are taken on board. And maybe Machi wants to elaborate a bit on that, how it works at the EU level as well, or anyone who would like to, to respond to these questions. What do you have to do to make it work? Much yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, I've so I've been I've been also busy replying to the to the questions uh, in the in the meantime. 
so so we we uh, I, th I think what, what I what I wanted particularly to say is around the the issue as there's there's few minutes uh, you know but people people have this tendency that well there's some people in the EU uh, creating these futures uh, for everyone and I think uh, this isn't uh, at all the purpose uh, of the exercises we're doing uh, so so our involvement tends to be kind of as broad. Uh, as as possible in a way, and it can be done in, in different ways. So also with the digital, uh, uh, with with kind of digital approaches to get people's input to actually have their stories heard. Uh, but but uh, to to make it happen, even kind of in a in a in a in a, in a practical way, uh, we actually went out and and got together. So what what you are doing also is actually bring the toolkits out to everyone. And, and get people to do these exercises all over Europe or, or anywhere in the world and actually get the results in and start sharing them between the groups and getting people to, to discuss what is similar, what is different. And, and we've been doing that also with toolkits in, in, in other areas. And there's been a broad of sort of what, what we get is much more, uh, much, much more often kind of uh, uh, diverse uh, and different than what we get in normal public consultations, and it complements these consultations in a in a very very interesting way in, in how in how people have have kind of replied to these questions, but also in how people kind of imagine uh, the future. So so this kind of spreading of toolkits, but also you know creating communities of people who will work with them and actually getting the results and bringing those results into into the thinking of the commission that that is very that is very useful and to also realize that okay it's a it's a toolkit but everybody's free to to um to put it in their context to actually use them in their in their own context and 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 to do not do not kind of be too strict with with what what we accept or not, I think I think uh, that's 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 kind of the key to 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 using those toolkits. So they are not only kind of a prescriptive area; they are they are kind of an enabling factor in, in getting people to think about the future. Okay, thank you, Maciej. I thank you very much, and I would like to thank to all the panelists because I think we are really approaching towards the end of the webinar. We would really encourage you to send us questions by email. And we will be responding to all of them because I think the time is really running. So thank you once again uh, for all the contributions and being with us today. And I think I will hand it over now to the director of the EMCD for the closing part of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you, everybody. I think it was a, a very special webinar, very intensive, uh, a bit more speakers than usually. So. Uh, I know the reason and I'm fully supportive. Uh, it, it was looking more like a distance course because uh, it's so rich uh, and I think it's bringing so many new things. Uh, and I think it's illustrated by the fact that uh, it's a bit less popular than the previous webinars. Uh, because if you are not a bit familiar with what it is, probably uh, you, you are not going to, to connect for two hours on the topic like that just at the first time. Uh, but I think to have gathered uh, around 100 persons for one and a half hour to to listen and to 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 hear and to react or to ask some questions either today or by email, it's it's a very good uh, very good point. Uh, a, a bit of answer to Rui Coimbra. Uh, I think the toolkit is for all, so it's not something for the elite. And I think it's a bit also what Massage was saying. So it's not something that is. Uh, that is just for the elite of, uh, of people who allow themselves to think. Uh, and therefore, uh, it has to be appropriated by everybody, including people who are using drug services. Uh, and of course, if we do these exercises, and that's it's the idea behind the way we work on it at the MCDDA, uh, we, sh we should associate it, involve all stakeholders, including uh, people who are using drugs or people working in drug services. Uh, so, um, a few quotes uh, and then a final remark, because I know we need to close. Uh, uh, I really would like to, to highlight what uh, Tim said. I think it was a fantastic presentation, Tim, as always. Uh, we said, you said working on the future has already an impact in the now. Foresight is an intervention in the now. Uh, I, I really like very much this, uh, this point. You made it a few times in your presentation because uh, I think it's part of uh, 
the reflection we started already years ago, asking ourselves, okay, we are collecting statistics, but what for? I mean, we, we have a data collection system on drugs, but what's the purpose for whom? Uh, what is the expected result? And so uh, uh, thinking about uh, foresight or futures uh, is part of this approach, but it, immediately the way you have to learn how to ask the questions is not only for futures, but it has an impact on what you already do daily. So thank you. And you also say the, uh, that speculation, for speculation, and I, I, that's something I find extremely important. The goal is to deliberate, to raise questions, uh, rather than uh, really the, the answers we are going to find at least at short term. Then there was um, uh, Paul who presented uh, together with Claudia uh, uh, what we tried to do. Um, and Claudia <coughs> presented brilliantly the, the toolkit. And, and, uh, and from Paul, I would quote that he said, the future is a journey uh, rather than a destination. Um, uh, and what, what I would, uh, I, I link this with uh, another kind of journey that uh, Brian shared with us. And he shared also the, the experience from Liz and, uh, and the colleagues and friends from Cienzano, Trimbos and the others um, is, is the fact that uh, there is also frustration and uh, uh, in trying to make decision makers, for instance, but they are not the only ones, uh, uh, to understand what we try to tell them or to make use of the evidence. And uh, Brian, you, you mentioned uh, somewhere in your, during your presentation uh, that the, we, we, could, uh, we could use this uh, and the toolkit and the methodology to find a common language. Um, and, and, and I think for me, one of the key words I associate with this work is co-production. Uh, which means that uh, uh, many times for us also at the MCDDA, we can, uh, we can have a fantastic project, fantastic data, nobody cares. How can we convince them when nobody cares about it? Um, well, there, are no, <laughs> there are no magic solutions, sorry to disappoint you, but, but the thing is with this kind of exercise and method, well, you, you, you need to involve more people. So if they are a bit involved, if they know a bit, why do you do that? Uh, and if they also have uh, maybe in some of the workshop can express uh, their questions, their concerns or their ideas, uh, maybe, it's, again, it's not magic, but maybe they can, uh, they can uh, uh, be a bit more receptive to what you would like to share with them. If it is only something, I don't know, I don't mean it's your case, but if it's only, for instance, EMCDDA or the focal point with some drug services or with people who, who are using drugs, the probability that uh, the others we listen to us, it's very low by definition. So for me, the, the foresight method, the toolkit, uh, offer one more way, a different way to deal with that. Uh, as we need to finish, uh, and before to, 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 to bring you the, the final uh, word on this, I, I would like to refer to two things uh, that, that uh, came to my mind uh, when I was listening to all the presentation. The first is CCAT OAS uh, seven, eight or nine years, ago, uh, they made for the first time uh, a scenario exercise and foresight exercise uh, that led the, to the production of four scenarios. And uh, it, this was a, a very interesting exercise, but the results have been completely lost. Uh, and I, I think probably part is uh, probably due to the changes also in the organization, the political priorities. Uh, but, but, but my the, the souvenir that I had uh, from the moment they published and shared with us was that um, uh, the, the scenarios they were presented a bit like the final result, uh, which means that nobody knew exactly what to think about those uh, and what can we do with those scenarios. Is it uh, that the future will be automatically be one of them? Uh, does it mean we have to choose? Um, and, and, and I think the, the, probably this was uh, one of the main uh, and, and also probably, I would guess that uh, probably some countries or some participating countries in the exercise uh, wanted to push for a political choice because it was before UNGAS. It was a moment where, especially from the Americas, they wanted to move uh, from the war on drugs to a more balanced policy, including public health. And I imagine that that's the reason why some scenarios were looking maybe more actually this may happen than others. Uh, and, and therefore I think the difficulties of the fact that it, it looks like it has not been really used after 
uh, is, is probably influenced by some of those factors. The, the second thing I've been thinking about, especially from the last presentation, is a, is a, is a fantastic book from uh, Nassim Nicolas Tayeb, which is called The Black Swan. Uh, in, in some of the big events that were mentioned uh, in, in some of the presentations, I, I think this, this idea developed by uh, uh, Nicolas Tayeb and others about the fact that there are other probabilities and that in the current economy, we try to use the cheapest one and the simplest one because they reduce dramatically the likelihood that something may happen. And because this likelihood is kind of artificially reduced, because uh, if it wasn't, it may cost uh, more. Uh, that's the reason why for Fukushima, the anti-tsunami wall was not built as it could have been because there were some quite cheap and easy to make probability that say that, oof, that's almost impossible that it would take, uh, that a tsunami could be up to seven uh, meters high. Other probabilities, other methods may have suggested different risks. And again, th this has to be with the way we look at those probabilities. So what, what, what is our intention and what are the next steps for EMCDD? Uh, and I think Paul and, and Claudia presented uh, already a big part of it. I, I would summarize saying new service offered by the EMCDD. Uh, that is free for use, uh, that, uh, that can count on some expert support, relatively limited for the moment, in the future to be more available and better offered by the MCDDA, because it's part of uh, what is covered by our new business model, but also by the new mandate of the center, which means also that there may be more human resources and more financial needs. And the idea is to provide in the future training of trainers as we do for the EUPC. This should be co-production. And for me, the rule should be free to use for everybody. One condition, you should share your experience with us. If it is just to use the toolkit that is not even belonging only to EMCDDA uh, and, and you don't enter in the exchange, I think you miss part of the philosophy of the tool, just to, to stress it uh, like that. And uh, I conclude with the, one of the last sentences of Massage, because that's what we ultimately want to create with the support, uh, active support of EMCDA, is to create a community of people who use the toolkit and the methodology uh, to share reflections, ideas about uh, what could happen as far as drugs are concerned in the future. Uh, and by definition, it's not the private property of co or copyright of anyone. But we have the ambition, as we do for other areas of work, to be one of the engines, not the only one, be, uh, behind the creation of such a community of practice. So thank you very much.